Good morning. Uh, one other announcement uh, this morning before I go into the introduction for our keynote speaker. Take some time today to visit our military exhibits, including the Naval Expeditionary Combat, Combat Command, who is here with us with three riverine boats. They're moored at the Fifth Avenue Landing Marina directly behind the Convention Center. And the boats will be available for viewing today between 0930 and 1600. So stop by the NECC booth, booth number 837, and they'll uh, escort you out there. And uh, I think it's, it's worth uh, like a three minute walk behind the Convention Center. If they're right next to the 170 foot sailboat, which is Mondo, but uh, it's really something. Um, also, I think many of you have already noticed it, but don't miss it if you haven't been there yet. Uh, we have an MH60 Sierra on the floor, and uh, it's great to see that kind of equipment uh, right here for your viewing. Next year, we're going to try to get a Romeo. We also have a uh, fairly full-scale uh, fire, so fire Scout model, and uh, I think you should check it out. So it's in the other corner on the panel side, so thank you. So now I'll get into the keynote. Uh, Supply, demand, and resources have been at the heart of our discussion here at the conference so far. And our keynote speaker this morning, Admiral Phil Davidson, Commander of U.S. Fleet Forces, is the person in the Navy who has the most influence on how we force generate combat-ready naval forces. A career surface warfare officer, he commanded the frigate Taylor. He's been the CEO of the USS Gettysburg, and he commanded the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group, CSG-8. In his most recent assignment, he was Commander 6th Fleet and Commander of the Naval Strike and Support Forces for NATO. No one who knows the Fleet Force's journey uh, understands better how this has evolved than some of the folks who are right up in the front here. But I think it's fair to say that we're at a turning point where we have to make sure that whatever we put out there is up to the task, is up to the high-end warfight, is ready to fight, and that there's sufficient bench strength behind it. And if you listened closely to our speakers on day one, you'll understand that I think they're there on the, the mission they're definitely there on the quality of what they're pushing out, but we're on the verge of not being able to do it on the bench strength. So we really look forward to hearing to Admiral, from Admiral Davidson here today, and let's give a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very very pleased to see you all. It's also wonderful to be in San Diego. Um, easy to leave the cold mid-Atlantic coast and northeast uh, to get here. Uh, I want you all to know that I'm seeing old friends here in the crowd, including old mentors. One just told me he was going to get up halfway through my speech and walk out. So I brought an extra water bottle to pitch at him, you know, when he goes walking out of the room. Um, if you don't know, this is the silver anniversary of this event. So congratulations to Lieutenant General Bob Wood and of course Vice Admiral Pete Daly um, for sustaining this wonderful forum for so long. <clears throat> and I think it's, I uh, was talking to one of our industry leaders just before the speech this morning and um, she noted how important it is to have this dialogue going forward and I couldn't agree more. Um, and it is the perfect time to have this symposium as well. The 2015 National Security Strategy was just released by the administration. Their prospective Secretary of Defense has just been on the Hill for his confirmation hearings. And the FY16 budget has been sent to the new Congress, a Congress sworn in just five weeks ago. I know many of you are involved in dissecting all of these events and doing it here in San Diego this week. The basis for your analysis may lie within the party politics or the amount of dollars spent, or the perceived balance between services, missions, and tasks, as well as what priorities may or may not be adequately served. My analysis is much simpler. My basis is the fleet, always the fleet. Now, as originally envisioned, this session was going to be a two-man show. Admiral Harry Harris was going to be here with me, 
in this time slot to talk about how the fleet commanders are answering the bell. Uh, Admiral Harris had to do another function this week, but I thought that was a good topic to, su to uh, sustain. Unfortunately for you, it means I have to speak twice as long. So, um, but I also thought that the session was well articulated answering the bell because the fleet, after all, is on my mind morning, noon, and night. Um, now, I've told everyone, from my mother, who has to understand what Fleet Forces Command does, to the staff itself and to the fleet, that I'm not a commander troubled by a ready-for-what equivocation. Pete hinted at this just a minute ago. It is quite clear to me that my job, the job of Fleet Forces Command, is to make the fleet ready to fight and win, both today and tomorrow. In combat, the only acceptable metric, the only acceptable result, would be found in combat success. When not in combat, I can only measure that in terms of mission success. Now, I can tell you that in my experience as a Sixth Fleet Commander, I'm pretty comforted by the performance of the fleet so far. It was an indicator that Fleet Forces Command was pushing out a pretty good product. If you look at the fleet's performance in the many challenges in 2014 alone, whether directing the neutralization of Syrian chemical weapons stockpiles at sea, meeting the rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, our recapture and repatriation of the motor vessel Morning Glory to Libya, to our fleet's readiness for assurance operations in response to the Russian invasion and seizure of Crimea, as well as the expeditionary response to the outbreak of Ebola in Western Africa, all of these were outstanding performances by the fleet. And by the way, those are just a few examples of the kinds of security challenges we have in the global scenery these days. But the point is, the fleet was ready to do the missions, to conduct prompt and sustained combat operations at sea, and I'll talk about that in a second, and play a significant role to deliver mission success in many of these other events. In September of last year alone, George H.W. Bush and Carrier Air Wing 8 were on scene overnight, overnight, in response to the Islamic State's advance in Iraq. And for 54 days, the Bush and Carrier Air Wing 8 were our nation's only manned strike option, conducting almost 2,000 combat sorties and more than 230 strikes during those 54 days alone. Bush escorts the USS Philippine Sea and the USS Arleigh Burke demonstrated their readiness for combat operations in conjunction with the initial Bush strikes, launching 47 Tomahawk cruise missiles against IS targets in Syria and Iraq as well. That's a ready force, conducting prompt combat operations at sea and delivering combat success. San Diego's own USS Carl Vinson and Carrier Air Wing 17 sustains this fight alongside the United States Air Force today, and they're flying combat missions six days a week. On Monday of this past week, the USS Theodore Roosevelt and Carrier Air Wing 1 completed its graduation exercise, its certification event, to be ready to go on deployment. And Theodore Roosevelt will now deploy in just a few weeks to replace Carl Vinson as next in the batter's box. So that's an indicator that we're ready to sustain this fight. And more on TR a bit later. <clears throat> of course, that describes our combat success the right-hand edge of the spectrum. Somewhere to the left of that is the myriad of missions we also execute as a result of our forward posture. We don't just deliver effects in terms of warheads downrange. The fleet gets called upon to deliver effects across all domains as well, including the diplomatic and even the scientific. The hydrolysis of Syrian chemical weapon precursor agents last year is an example of just that kind of left of kinetic mission success. Task Force 64, our fleet team of sailors, civilian mariners, and U.S. Army chemical engineers, in and around the motor vessel Cape Ray, completed the first ever neutralization of chemical weapon agents attempted at sea. The fleet performed admirably. In addition to leading the ships, submarines, aircraft, security, and other expeditionary elements from 11 nations at the tactical level, the ad hoc team that was Task Force 64 helped identify solutions to the chemical agent processing challenges at sea. These were challenges that had never before prevented them, excuse me, presented themselves in ashore operations. 
In all, this was a major sustained operation, 10 months from planning to completion of execution, and there were numerous equities at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels, at the interagency, at the United Nations, with a multitude of allies and foreign organizations, and with commercial industry. It had numerous tactical challenges as well, not combat challenges. But again, it is an example of our readiness to do the nation's missions and the smart, educated people that we have in the fleet to put against them. As with all missions, there was only one acceptable outcome to that task, and that was mission success. Now, to sidebar for just a second, I must add, these are just two of the examples of the benefits of a forward deployed force, something that our strategy is so dependent upon. And our forward deployed force is our long-held benchmark that describes the Navy's readiness of forward deployed force. As the CNO says, presence is our mandate and we deliver. For the fleet commander, and to the point of this session here, those last two words must have the modifier. We will deliver. We must deliver. Nevertheless, the benchmark is proof enough it takes a ready force just to be forward. As I said, as a numbered fleet commander, I was quite pleased with the readiness and the result. So, Fleet Forces Command, Commander-in-Chief U.S. Pacific Fleet, excuse me, Commander U.S. Pacific Fleet is uh, doing something right as well. Now, how am I answering the bell? I will tell you unabashedly, I am fortunate to follow Shortney here. He has given fleet, uh, the fleet the organizing principle, like OFRP, as well as the analytical underpinning that is the readiness kill chain. And he evolved fleet processes and our partnership with the Pacific Fleet and the other Echelon II commanders in a way to ensure that Navy-wide we were delivering readiness. So as part of Fleet Forces Command job to make the fleet ready to answer the bell, I intend to see these initiatives through. Job one. OFRP is a big piece of our future. It is not enough to say that OFRP returns predictability to our sailors. It is more complete to say that OFRP is returning predictability and responsiveness to the fleet. It is aligning our ways and means to our deployability and our surgeability ends so that we can properly align and fund our resources in maintenance, manpower, equipment, and training. In turn, this will produce combat-capable naval forces in a sustainable and a more predictable manner. So the optimize is partially meant to mean reach alignment. And we are already beginning to see the goodness that it will bring, especially in manpower. We already have far fewer fleet manpower actions directing cross decks and TDYs. We are meeting or exceeding our fit and fill goals. And we have the manpower aligned to their fill excuse me, <clears throat> we have the manpower aligned to their fleet units before the training cycle, not just right before deployment. Next up on the agenda is shipyard maintenance. Our backlog in maintenance is a result of two major occurrences in the past two years. One, our need to reset the force after our two and a half years of sustained 2.0 carrier operations in Central Command, as well as the recovery necessary from the FY13 sequester and the resulting civilian furloughs at our public shipyards. We, the fleet and the SISCOMs, are working hard to get predictability in the maintenance plan as well as restoring the civilian manpower and the civilian skills needed in our public shipyards, recapitalizing those shipyards and the fleet readiness centers on the air side as well. This is critical to instilling stability and cost predictability in our maintenance planning. And it's what's going to make OFRP go. We've got to get our assets through maintenance on time and on cost. Of course, there's much more to do than just seeing these initiatives through as job one. Much more to making the fleet ready to fight and win. As we go forward, it is up to the Fleet Forces Command to build on the OFRP RKC Foundation, those processes that are letting us have this discussion. And our work is cut out for us. Today's fight is evolving rapidly. Admiral Daly and I were just talking about this a few minutes ago. Some nation states, America's competitors and potential adversaries flexing their muscles abroad, are matching vastly improved technologies in the air, on and under the sea, and in space and cyberspace 
And they're matching that with the ambiguous methodologies, some false narratives, and the brutality of the non, excuse me, of the worst non-state actors as well, like terrorists. And still, events like last month's terror attacks in Paris, the growing attacks by Boko Haram, and the continued horrific acts of ISIS serve as notice of the brutality and persistence of the worst of the non-state actors. And we cannot discount their aspirations to match their methods of terror with high-end technology, whether it's stolen, bought, seized, hijacked, or provided to them. <clears throat> this has created a new hybrid in our preparations for warfare, one that requires us to prepare the fleet to fight and win in this evolved battle space, to be ready to employ the force in denied or contested environments of all kinds on, under and above the sea, in space and cyberspace, indeed, even in the information domain, and to be able to deliver the capabilities the nation demands still, old and new alike, wherever and whenever needed. So I take this as my next order of business, to ready the force for employment in this new battle space, to be absolutely prepared to fight and win in contested or denied environments of all kinds. These are the very fights the Navy will see in its immediate future. What does this mean exactly? In our recent history, the Gulf Wars, in the Adriatic, in the North Arabian Sea, in action against Libya, and in numerous other contingencies, we operated the fleet in a fashion that leveraged our significant technological advantages, our precision weaponry, our phenomenal situational awareness, and our superior command and control systems, amongst others with the confidence that should we be challenged in that battle space, we would defeat that challenge with a turn of the firing key. Well, given all we've observed in the Western Pacific, in the Persian Gulf, certainly my experience in the Eastern Mediterranean and along the periphery of the Black Sea, it is clear that technology alone cannot be the only thing that provides our tactical advantage. Simply put, the firing key cannot be the only tactic. We need to get further left in the adversary's kill chain. This begins with tactical development, the first step in our campaign to seize the initiative in this new battle space. We're already seeing feedback from our numbered fleet commanders as they adapt with new operational methods and tactics. Additionally, we have a robust program of fleet experimentation, which drives directly at solving the challenges in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum and with area denial weapon systems. Much of what we're seeing indicates an opportunity for added tactical advantage on the left side of the adversary's kill chain. This is where the United States Navy can leverage physical and cyberspace maneuver, information warfare operations, and other non-kinetic effects and fires. Now, while some of our brightest tactical minds have been assembled to get after this challenge, we've begun to flesh out tactics rooted in the principles of electromagnetic maneuver warfare, or EMW. Fundamentally, our ability to conduct electromagnetic warfare is about our ability to see, communicate, move, and act in a denied electromagnetic environment. That's my own lingo for the higher end discussion, which is battle space awareness, assured C2, fires and maneuver. All this is geared to an expressed end state to gain the decisive military advantage, achieving our freedom of action in the battle space, all while denying the adversary's own. So we're working hard at this problem, and our nascent EMW tactical developments have us on a good initial course. Yet I would also maintain that adversary attempts to deny us the RF spectrum and or cyberspace are just two manifestations in a world of increasing encounters with contested and denied environments of all kinds. Our tactical commanders, our ship and squadron COs, will need to balance the application of EMW principles across all warfare areas, while also demanding and obtaining the most exquisite understanding of their environment, the physical geography, the ambient shipping and marine traffic, and of course their adversary, and then applying that understanding in their tactical development. That's where the application of tactical development, the concepts across the kill chain that I highlighted, comes together with refinements in our training program and our training organizations. 
To fight and win in the future, we're going to need to be open to change, honest about where we can improve, and imaginative in structuring the opt for that we can present. So as I told you, we're getting on, excuse me, we're working on getting stable, dedicated unit and advanced warfare focused integrated training. That's part of the OFRP benefit. But we're also working to improve our tactical training culture across the force and throughout our sailors' careers. We've been doing a lot of SOP. We need to do TTP as well. Our discussion on warfighting development centers is a direct outcome of a desire to better organize and align the training enterprise to improve our tactical training culture. We're looking closely at the lessons and successes of the aviation community and their commitment to redefining tactical excellence in air-to-air -air combat following Vietnam, or excuse me, during Vietnam, and again, uh, with Strike Q after Lebanon in the early 80s. The cultural and organizational structuring, all deliberate, provided tangible improvements to their operational and tactical advantage in the air. Given the closing technological gaps I described earlier, the fleet will need the same approach to our tactical culture across all capability platforms. For our sailors, the need is getting the necessary reps and sets in contested environments of all kinds. <coughs> helping to infuse new tactics into evolved doctrines and cultivating the minds of our warfighters to think in new and creative ways. Some of the training improvements being planned include refreshed tactical training courses and the addition of warfare tactics instructors akin to what the aviation community calls patch wearers across all the platform capabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I welcome invigorating and imaginative improvements in the quality and quantity of our tactical training to our sailors. At the strike group level, <clears throat> in the integrated training phase of deployment preparations, our refinements continue to evolve. Over the last year, each successive strike group has been seeing more advanced warfare training, more robust op for capability, and <clears throat> more time operating in denied or contested environments. And when I talk about denied and contested uh, contested environments of all kinds. I'm talking about <clears throat> RF spectrum denial, yes, but I'm also talking about area denial missile systems and anti-submarine warfare demands. In fact, we've recently resumed live submarine play in our integrated training phase so that we can get after increased ASW proficiency. Now, I saw this myself last week out on the USS Theodore Roosevelt's Com2X. <clears throat> TR Strike Group faced stiff challenges in the undersea, on the surface, in the air, and cyberspace domains. One thing that TR has to their advantage, they have our most advanced battle awareness system in the Navy's Integrated Fire Control Counter Air, or NIFCA, capability. The TR Carrier Strike Group will deploy as our Navy's first NIFCA capable strike group, able to see better, see further, and see more precisely into the battle space. And then they're able to act further into that battle space with multiple distributed firing platforms should action be necessary. It's a revolution. I saw this and many other innovative tactical concepts employed to great effect. So in the wake of this, <clears throat> I've given an immediate task to our training enterprise to strike groups 4 and 15, to the <clears throat> NWDC, as well as our fleet N7 organizations. What can I do right now to deliver on training scenarios to better test our forces in contested and denied environments. Three questions to start. First, do we have the imagination to impose what we need to impose in this EMW regime onto our blue forces, our exercising forces? Second, do I have the physical capability to impose realistic high fidelity orange force actions on our forces? Some of that's gonna be live, some of it will be virtual, some of it will be simulated, but I gotta have it. <clears throat> and third, do we, the Blue Forces, have the systems to effectively monitor their own force emissions of all kinds, electromagnetic, acoustic, wake generation, et cetera, not just during the exercise, but throughout their deployment and throughout all their operations. This task, you know, a constant assessment process, is never ending. It's one we need to continuously evaluate to get after what we believe are the fights that we'll face in our immediate future. All that, all this drags me back to my Fleet Forces Command priorities. How will I know 
if I'm getting this kind of tactical ingenuity and development. <clears throat> to many, this is fleet insider speak, but as any operational commander knows, we can get to this level of understanding if our assessment processes work effectively. And in Fleet Forces Command's case, in a way that helps to both improve upon and synchronize the relationship between the processes of generating the force, that is to say, getting the fleet trained and ready, properly manned and equipped and out the door to be forward, and developing the force, which is to say, manning, training, and equipping it to be ready for what's coming in the future. That's the third part of my agenda at Fleet Forces Command and the part that will benef most benefit our warfighting practices. Now, I went through a lot. The challenges of our age are immense and they're changing all the time. But I believe we have the tools and most importantly the people to set the course, work through the problems and succeed. Again, my experience as a Sixth Fleet Commander shows any mission that you throw at us, we've got the people that we can apply to it. <clears throat> We often underestimate the capabilities of our people, but I know they are up to the task when we call upon them. We're ensuring that critical fleet forces initiatives are seen through to completion. We're modifying our means of ensuring the fleet is ready to operate in contested and denied environments of all kinds, the big fight. And we are putting rigor in our assessment processes to synchronize the development of the force and the generation of the force in the years to come. If we do these three things, we can indeed say that we are answering the bell, and we will ensure the fleet then is ready to fight and win. Thanks again for having me here this morning. Admiral Daly, Lieutenant General Wood, I appreciate that a lot. <clears throat> thanks again to the, organiz the organi organizers <laughs> of this event, and uh, thank you uh, for your 25 years of excellence. I appreciate the conversation that comes together in this room between the military, um, civilian academia and industry here. It's a good conversation and we need to continue to have it. Um, the three priorities I kind of laid out just in the training realm alone um, is going to be a discussion amongst those entities. I thank you, all of you in this room, whether you're serving now, have served, or you serve our nation in the defense industry. I frequently tell people in Virginia that we stand in the military on the shoulders of industry giants. Um, the aircraft carriers that are constructed in Virginia is a miracle of technology that I can't get over every time I'm on it. Um, we need your continued thought and continued investment to help this nation be successful in the, in the many years to come. Okay, I'm happy to take your questions this morning, and I understand there's a technology trick to doing it all. <laughs> so, all right. Good Thank morning, sir. The first question. Yes, Lord. <laughs> How are your sailors holding up at the deck plate level across the deployments, and are you making particular investments in support of them and their families that you could highlight? Yeah, I, I think they're holding up well. I mean, certainly my encounters uh, with the units that deployed to the Sixth Fleet, they are enthusiastic. They've got the parts and resources they need, and um, they're answering the bell, as I mentioned. Um, deployment length has been a problem. We still have a couple of longer deployments to go, but we are planning seven-month deployments. They are on the books already. Um, uh, it's going to take us a little longer with our Ballistic Missile Defense Force, but I think deployment length certainty will help. Um, at this point, the best we can do is plan, um, but that is our objective, and fundamentally, that's what OFRP is designed to deliver. Thank you, sir. Next question. Has readiness reporting shown downward trends based on sequestration, and what metrics are you using to predict future readiness based on budget changes? Yeah, I mean, we're still climbing out of the sequester impacts. And as a fleet commander, I saw it immediately forward. Ships showed up that needed uh, material or repairs um, as soon as they arrived in theater. <clears throat> Once we got clear to that environment, the ships immediately were you know, on step as soon as they hit the theater. Um, you know the readiness metrics. I'm not going to take you all through them again. They're, they're still applicable for our future. Um, I can tell you that if we're sequestered again this coming year, the readiness impact is going to be profound. We are not going to be able to do everything that the nation has asked us to do in the strategy. Next question. How will the Navy overcome the shortfall in amphibious shipping 
and has thought been given to leveraging partner nation forces amphibious shipping? Um, uh, without commenting on whether we have a shortfall in amphibious shipping or not, you know, we're adding platforms to the fleet that have incredible capability. Um, you saw the, the USS Lewis B. Puller got commissioned here in San Diego just this past Saturday. That's a capability enhancement that the nation needs uh, going forward. So I think that's a great plus. Um, can you say the second part of your question again? Oh, the, um, about partners. Yeah, my time at Sixth Fleet, I'm seeing a lot of the capability that has come forward in modularized amphibious forces. Um, to be fair, I'm a little concerned about some of the robustness in those platforms. Um, that said, they bring capability um, across the spectrum, by that I mean phase zero into phase three, that's gonna be very, very useful to us. Importantly, we still have NATO striking and support forces, okay, commanded there by the Sixth Fleet commander, but in Lisbon um, now. We need that capability. It used to be two organizations, one in the Med and one on the East Coast of the United States. Um, that capability and its ability to operate at the high end with very large amphibious forces has been sustained by NATO, is the key uh, headquarters at the operational level that will bring you know, foreign assets in together with uh, US operations and would be the greatest really um, kind of integrator of that, delivering that capability forward. Thank you, next question. In a similar vein, has OFRP reached the amphibious community and has it been integrated with the Marine Corps' deployment cycle? Um, Bob Neller and I talk about this every day. Um, and certainly they are supportive of o OFRP and we're moving forward together in that. Um, we have not started amphibious uh, forces into the OFRP cycle. We're just getting started with introducing carrier forces into it, um, but that's coming imminently. Thank you. Secretary Work mentioned yesterday that doing things differently with what we have as part of our offset strategy what might innovation look like for ships and aircraft? Um, I, I did not hear um, DepSec Def's, I guess I can't, ask the, I can't ask the Lord for more clarity on his question. Um, say the question one more time, please. Secretary Work mentioned yesterday that mm -hmm. doing things differently with what we have will be part of our offset strategy. Mm -hmm. What might innovation look like for our ships and aircraft? Well, one of the things I talked about here just a few minutes ago was the importance of returning tactical development. You know, there's been a lot of work done in the fleet on swarming boats, FAC and, FAC and FIAC boats. Um, we have tactics, techniques, techniques and procedures that have been exchanged with the technical community in a way that has improved the firing chain in a five inch gun alone, for example. You know, so there's a capability improvement as example, um, is the kind of thing that I'm trying to talk about as we go forward in tactical development. We need to make sure that that is invigorated going forward. Thank you. Given that potential adversaries are doing more in space, what specifically are we doing to hold realistic training in a GPS-denied environment? Yeah, that's, that's a challenge here early. Um, so many of our weapon systems are dependent on uh, precision navigation and timing. Um, we can restrict kind of our fleet's awareness at this point, but it's much more difficult to kind of restrict um, their weapon capabilities thing. And again, this is something that I mentioned in the speech that we have to get after. Can I impose the conditions, you know, as an orange force provider, which Fleet Forces Command has to do as well, to effectively do that? Um, it's an important agenda item going forward. <coughs> Thank you. Next question. Given A2 AD capabilities that threaten to push naval forces beyond the manned carrier air wing range, how will the Navy strike from range in the future? And why is the Navy pursuing a carrier based ISR ACID in U class rather than unmanned strike in UCAV? Yeah, I, the discussion about what that future vehicle might be is ongoing. Um, I think it's unfair to say that there are positions kind of staked out on this thing. Um, uh, it looks like it's going to be pushed off a couple of years, in fact, just so that we can better define um, that capability and what we need going forward. Thank you, sir. Next question. 
Could you talk about fleet training and your initiatives regarding integrated allied and coalition forces and their capabilities? And what are the cybersecurity issues in this process? And are you making progress? Yeah, um, f we are. Um, first, um, we're, we're getting out of kind of the custom um, network build system. You know, we have the Entitids N, I'm gonna mispronounce it here, NTIDS, Entitids, Centric's backbone now, and future kind of coalition environments are gonna be built on that backbone. Um, we can't have custom coalition environments from theater to theater to theater. So we're in the process of transitioning out of the custom ones and towards that more consistent backbone is just the first um, piece of the, the information connectivity between the forces. On the second, you know, we've been operating on cooperative deployments over the last several years on the East Coast. Certainly out in the Western Pacific, uh, the Seventh Fleet interacts with its key allies out there quite frequently. Um, so we see that. Um, Bold Alligator is another forum on the East Coast which um, is occurring at least on an annual basis, either in a simulated or live environment, and has really brought back, um, brought a lot of interaction from the NATO uh, navies to participate in that action as well. One of the things we'd like to do getting forward is if we can generate uh, the presence required in European command, you really help um, uh, NATO ally readiness if you can spend just a little bit more time in there with a carrier or amphibious formations, because many of you know um, we had exercise series there that were either under the NATO umbrella or the US umbrella that were incredibly robust back in the day. I'll forget all the names, but display determination, strong resolve, those are some of the things that really um, sparked that memory. The allies would love to come to forum like that. And I think the benefit, particularly on an annual basis, um, to provide that training as opposed to one country getting a cooperative deployment every five years with a carrier strike group, you know, would help their reps and sets along the way. That would do the most to improve our interoperability there. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. The first one, could you talk about any adaptation in the training model that puts training in front of rapidly evolving technology and the integration of that technology in the fleet? Yeah, I'll give you an example. The integrated live fire events that uh, Fleet Forces Command ran with uh, NWDC in just the last couple of years here that were designed to improve our integration of air, helicopter, you know, fixed wing air, helicopter, and surface fires against swarming FAC and FIAC. That was really good. Um, the lessons that were learned in that process got fed back to the technical community. Improvements were made in just the one example in the five inch um, fire control system. Uh, to, to evolve the tactic to the next level, and we're seeing a lot more success against that, uh, against that threat. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. And the final question, if you had to cite a number of desired improvements in your fleet technical capabilities, what might that list look like? <laughs> Say it one more time. <clears throat> if you had to cite a number of desired improvements in your fleet technical capabilities, what might that list look like? Well, you know, I, I made mention uh, during my speech about our ability to see, uh, see, tell, uh, move, and act. Um, the kind of protections we need on the defensive side are going to import, be important. Assured C2 can't all be about operating in smaller and smaller bandwidths. You know, we've got to drive protections into all the systems that we have so that we can help continue to leverage some of this technology. Um, at the same time, we've got to prepare the force to be ready um, to operate in an environment in which they don't have that network available to, to them at all times. And that's the point of the training uh, paradigm and modifications we need to make going forward. Okay. Can I say a few words here? Admiral Davidson, we know your time is precious. You came all the way out here from Norfolk to see us, and uh, we also understand a lot better having heard your comments about the role of fleet forces and where you intend to take it, and that's extremely valuable to our discussion here this week. So thank you. I've got a Naval Institute Press book, Fire on the Water, by Robert Haddock. It's got an FC, a bookmark. It doesn't quite cover uh, the time and the flight, but uh, we have immense gratitude that you're here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh,